Right now on Morning News Now, former President Donald Trump entering a not guilty plea to election interference charges and waiving his right to an in-person arraignment in Georgia. We'll break down the newest court filing and what it could mean for Trump's case. Also, devastation across Florida in the aftermath of Hurricane Adalia. This morning, FEMA officials are on the ground in the hardest hit areas as people return home to recover and rebuild. You always hope that it passes you by, and most of the time it does, but this time it didn't. We'll bring you the latest, including President Biden's plans to see the damage firsthand. Plus, the holiday getaway is underway this morning. Millions of Americans are expected to hit the road and take to the skies this Labor Day weekend. What you need to know if you're making last-minute plans. And he's flipping the script in more ways than one. Blue Beetle star Sholo Maradueña just made history as the first Latin lead superhero in a DC movie. Now, with the ongoing strikes in Hollywood, the actor is pursuing another passion, music. Hear his conversation with our own Joe about his new single, his love for 90s hip hop, and the message he wants to send as an artist. Always a good Friday when we have a flipping the script. Exactly. Because <laughs> of the strike, he can't talk about any of his acting projects, but music, music we can talk about. It's a fun conversation. And whether he can talk about that movie or not, he's obviously making a name for himself because of that right now. So exactly. it's so exciting that you exactly. got to sit down with good him. Good morning. Good to have you with us on this Friday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for being here. We begin this morning with former President Donald Trump entering a plea in Georgia's 2020 election interference case. Trump pleaded not guilty yesterday to charges, including racketeering and conspiracy in connection with with efforts to overturn the election result in Georgia. Trump's lawyer submitted the plea in writing. That means he will not have to show up in person at next week's arraignment. For more on this, we are joined by NBC News legal analyst Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, good to have you with us. So no surprise here as expected, Trump pleading not guilty to these charges. But what's the significance of waiving his arraignment? You know, ordinarily, Joe, defendants are required to appear personally when they're arraigned on the charges. Arraignment is just a fancy term for being put on formal notice, having your indictment read to you so you know the charges against which you're going to have to defend. Um, the judge permitted him to waive a personal appearance. And I have to believe that because Donald Trump really makes all of his decisions based on how things will play in the court of public opinion, not in a court of law, he must have decided that perhaps there was no more grifting to be done off a second personal appearance in Georgia. So his attorney opted to waive his appearance. Now we'll see when he is next required to be in court for a status hearing. So, Glenn, Trump's attorneys have also moved to separate or sever his case from the 18 other co-defendants. Trump's lawyer said he wouldn't be ready to go to trial by October 23rd. That's when the DA wants to start. So what does this mean for the case? How is this decision ultimately made? Yeah, this is actually pretty interesting because there are two co-defendants, Kenneth Cheesebro and Sidney Powell, who have already demanded a speedy trial. The judge set a trial for October 23rd for Cheesebro. We assume that Sidney Powell will probably be added to that mix. So I think Judge McAfee, the presiding judge down in Georgia, can rightly turn to Donald Trump and the other more than dozen co-defendants and say, it's clearly possible to be ready for trial by the end of October. A number of co-defendants are demanding it. Why is it that others can't be prepared to go to trial? I think that's probably a legitimate observation. But, Joe, I don't think all 19 co-defendants are going to be put in that October trial date. I think you're going to see a series of trials set over time. Glenn, one more development. A judge confirmed cameras will be allowed in the courtroom for the remaining hearings, for the trials. This is standard protocol in Georgia still. Are you surprised at all by this? And, and then what kind of impact could that have on the case? Because this may be very well the only Trump case where we see cameras in the court. Yeah, I'm not surprised that Georgia is following sort of its normal operating procedures. They're going to allow cameras in the courtroom. And that is so important for the American people. Um, he here's the thing. If you have no cameras in the courtroom, if there's no transparency regarding what's going on, you will have certain attorneys step to the cameras at the end of every day and announce that, you know, the government's case is falling apart. The prosecutor's case is not looking good. And the prosecutors will not step to the cameras at the end of the day because prosecutors are prohibited from speaking publicly about pending cases or pending trials. So 
in the court of public opinion, it'll be a little of a one-sided affair. That's why I think it's so important for the people, the voters, to be able to see for themselves what's going on. And I hope the federal court follows suit and they allow cameras in the courtroom as well. But that's an open question. Yeah, explain that one to us, because we know pretty much if it's federal court, no cameras in the court. How could that possibly happen in this situation? So there's an organization, um, the U.S. Conference of Judges, headed up by Supreme Court uh, Justice, uh, the Chief Justice, John Roberts. That body has the ability to um, grant an exception and to allow cameras in the courtroom. I maintain that because one of the charges in the January 6th case, the federal case in Washington, D.C., is a conspiracy to defraud the voters of the full value of their vote. That makes the voters the victims. And there's a law on the books called the Crime Victims' Rights Act that says victims may not be excluded from the trial. So I think there, there's a groundswell perhaps starting for cameras in the courtroom in Washington, D.C. See what happens. Glenn Kirshner, thanks so much for kicking us off. We appreciate it. Well, a Proud Boys leader convicted of seditious conspiracy has now received one of the longest sentences in connection with the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Joe Biggs was sentenced yesterday to 17 years in federal prison. Prosecutors had sought a 33-year sentence, saying Biggs, quote, served as an instigator and leader that day. Biggs was convicted in May on numerous other charges, including obstruction of an official proceeding and destruction of government property. Now to the aftermath of Hurricane Adalia. This morning, federal officials are on the ground still trying to assess the destruction left behind. Homeland Security Advisor Liz Sherwood Randall says it'll be days before we know the full extent of the damage. President Biden plans to travel to Florida tomorrow to tour the areas most impacted by the hurricane. He made the announcement yesterday during a visit to FEMA headquarters. He also reassured storm victims they will get the help they need. And to the people of Florida, and throughout the southeast, uh, I'm here to make clear that our nation has your back and we are not going to we're, we're not going to walk away. We're not going to give up. We're not going to slow down. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa is in Horseshoe Beach, Florida, with the latest. Joe Savannah, good morning from Horseshoe Beach, Florida, one of the areas that was initially cut off. And now we've gotten access. You can see the roads have reopened and you can see the damage is insurmountable. I mean, this clearly used to be a house, right? You can see kind of the raised foundation, the wood framing, and then just right on top of that, the metal roofing. And there's basically nothing in between now. A ton of houses in this area look like this. A number of cars and trucks have been tossed into the water, entire homes in tossed into the water. This area was hit really hard. Right as we got access to this area yesterday, President Biden made his announcement at the FEMA headquarters that he is going to be coming to Florida tomorrow to see the devastation for himself and promise people that aid is coming. That announcement coming alongside a series of sort of updates yesterday from officials in Florida and in Georgia, chief among them. We now know three people died during this storm. Two, according to the Florida Highway Patrol here in Florida, those were in separate car crashes during the storm. And then a third in Georgia when officials say a tree fell on a car. Around that time, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis also seeing the devastation in communities like this, making it clear that as horrible as these areas look, and specifically Horseshoe Beach looks, he said there were no reports, and we haven't seen any reports, of any serious injuries or deaths in this area. And he said, as devastating as this storm has been, that, he said, was at least a good sign that people in these areas took this storm seriously and heeded those evacuation warnings. Guys, I'll send it back to you. All right, Maggie, thank you so much. Amy Firestein joins us now. She's the owner of the Faraway Inn in Cedar Key, Florida, one of the many businesses that sustained damage in the storm. Amy, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. I know this is a difficult time, so we really appreciate it. First, just walk us through what your experience was during this hurricane, during this storm. I understand that you were sort of off of the area where this actually hit and where your inn is, but tell us what you did exactly and what you saw. Um, so when we were able to come back onto the island, uh, after the hurricane and we had seen pictures and videos of the devastation, it still was <clears throat> unbelievable until you come up and see it. 
Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, no, please. I, I know how difficult this must be. Um, so, so you own this in, and that's exactly what it was uh, that sustained this damage. Tell us, yeah. when you saw it, explain some of the damage to me, the destruction to your property. So we lost um, a few of, uh, we lost our cottage. Uh, it's down to uh, just the foundation. Um, another cottage is missing a wall. Uh, we do have one cottage that's perfectly untouched and ready to be rented. Um, we've lost another building that's the golf view rooms. Um, there's just a lot of cleanup, a lot of damage, a lot of things that need to be done. It's a little overwhelming. I think today is more because we're tired now mm -hmm. and we've gotten in there and kind of see what we need to do. I know volunteers are on their way today. We have great guests and I've had so many reach out that are coming out to help us and um, coming to clean today. Cedar Key has opened up for all volunteers to come. I know there's a lot of GoFundMe pages. Um, I know we have one that's getting set up now. I know uh, Tidewater Tours has one, Steamers, uh, Tipsy Cow, uh, 83 West. There's quite a few businesses that have them set up, but also just volunteers coming in to help us clean up. There's a lot of cleanup. Oh, and when you say guests, you mean people who have previously stayed there are coming to help yes. you? Yes. Oh, oh, yes. We have incredible. them on the way. I've got... I've got a group coming from Melbourne uh, tomorrow, or today, tonight they're coming. So oh. family from Port St. Lucie. I mean, we have amazing guests for 20 plus years that have been so supportive. Oh my goodness. That love Cedar incredible. Key, love Far Away In. So we're very lucky with that. And tell me what this is going to mean for your business. I mean, even just thinking, you know, this is a holiday weekend. I'm sure people were planning to come stay at your property. Obviously that's not gonna be possible. What's this gonna mean for your business? Uh, we will lose all of that we were full for this weekend um labor day weekend so we are losing that hopefully within the next couple of weeks we can have a few cottage uh, one cottage and a few rooms that we have available but it also depends when cedar key can open up and businesses for people to come back so we're going to take a hit for a little while and now we're starting to deal with insurance and see what's covered and what's not so Absolutely. It's going to be difficult. Tell me a little bit more about the area in general. What else have you seen in Cedar Key? Uh, I've seen the gas stations gone, so there's no gas on the island right now. So for volunteers, make sure you get gas before you come to the island. The marketplace has no, um, it's closed, so there's no food place on the island right now. The restaurants are closed. Uh, a lot of damage to people's homes. I know the people next to us lost their entire first floor. So it's just a lot a lot going on for everybody in Cedar Key, but it's a strong community. Everybody's helping. You know, I got neighbors coming and checking on me. I, we got people bringing us food, bringing water. So it's a strong community. We'll rebuild. Absolutely. It does sound like so much of the support that you're getting are from just these people that you know and have personal relationships with. Beyond yes. that, are you getting the type of official help and support that you need? Uh, it's been so quick. I know the governor was there yesterday to see. So it's just, it's just happened. So I know the locals have been great with the help. We'll see how much comes in after that. It does appear that people are trying to help and the government is trying to help. And it's also just us together, the uh, Cedar Key people just helping each other and volunteers coming in. That's a huge help for today. There's a lot of cleanup. <laughs> Amy Firestein, we are thinking about you and your community. Thank, thank you. you so much for joining us this thank morning. You. We'd love to check in with you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Labor Day weekend is here, of course, as we were just discussing. Well, for millions of Americans, that does mean it's time to get away for the long holiday weekend. The travel site Hopper Travel says this year will be 14% busier than last year's. So for more, we're joined by Hopper's lead economist, Haley Berg. Haley, good to have you with us on this Friday as we head into the holiday. We're expecting more people to get away for the long weekend this year. And there is good news when it comes to the cost of that travel, right? Yes, airfare for Labor Day weekend this year is considerably lower than last year and lower than what you would have paid in 2019. So those travelers who are headed to domestic destinations paid around $225 on average, which is a huge improvement to some of the really insane prices that we've seen over the last couple of years. Absolutely. If you did wait until the last minute or maybe if you're still looking kind of to book things, what can you expect at this point? Have prices gone up significantly or can you still find some good deals? Prices do always rise rapidly in the last couple of days before departure, but if you're looking to sneak in a really quick getaway, 
try to look at flights departing on Saturday, coming back on Tuesday. That's yeah. really where the only flight deals will be available. But don't forget about staycations. Oftentimes over long weekends like Labor Day, big cities empty out and yeah. luxury hotels, great accommodations in these big cities sit empty. You can often get a very good last minute deal. So consider sticking around town and you might be able to get an even bigger vacation for your budget. Oh. And a reservation at a restaurant that might be normally tough to get into. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea, too. Definitely. So what are the top travel destinations on a weekend like this Labor Day weekend? Labor Day weekend is typically very domestic heavy. We're seeing a lot of travelers headed to Las Vegas, Atlanta, Denver, destinations within the U.S. But we're also seeing a pretty good amount of demand to destinations like San Juan, Puerto Rico and Cancun. So definitely a bias towards these warm weather destinations as we head into fall. Anything under the radar we should be thinking about? We should be prepared for disruptions this weekend. We know the hurricane has just passed through much of the South, and there are likely to be some of those, we call them snowball effect delays and cancellations, inbound aircraft. A few airports were closed earlier this week due to weather. So if you're headed to the airport, be prepared. Expect slightly longer lines. It's going to be a very busy weekend. But on the whole, we're hoping to see, you know, very busy airports, lots of people headed to their destinations on time. A lot of hot weather all around the country. When we talk about airports, just overall, how do you assess this last summer when it comes oh. to travel, especially by air compared with the nightmare that was last year? Yeah. We have seen improvements in disruption rates compared to last year. You know, in July of last year, we were seeing 30% of flights delayed, at as much as 8% of flights canceled on departure. So much improvement from that. But the reality is today, disruptions are higher than they were pre-pandemic. About you know one in five flights is going to be delayed on departure. One to 2% of flights consistently canceled. It just means that travelers need to be even more prepared to advocate for themselves, mm. know what's included in their ticket, and we're seeing the rise of consumers choosing to buy flexibility and disruption products, paying a little bit extra to protect their trip in the event of one of these disruptions so they can you know, take the value of that ticket they initially bought, use it to get home to their destination or for unexpected accommodations. A lot of times what you end up seeing, though, is like those super long lines at the help counters and things like that. What's like just your top tip if you are in one of those situations, especially over a holiday weekend? Everyone has their phone with them at the airport. So get in line with customer service, but get on the phone as well. Oftentimes there are gonna be hundreds more customer service agents in a phone bank mm. than physically at your terminal. Get on the phone, but also download your airlines app. You might be able to change your flight or book yourself on rebook yourself on the next available flight directly in the app before you know the other 200 people in line with you are rebooked on that flight ahead of you. I had a fl flight canceled recently. I ran as fast as I've ever run in my life to get to the front of that line. <laughs> the <laughs> it's the I most mean, exercise I had all summer. Sometimes when you feel so bad, you see people crying in the line. Oh, like, no, you know, no. It's just like it turns into total chaos real quick. All yeah. right. <laughs> Haley Berg, we wish you a non-chaotic yeah. holiday weekend. Thanks yes, for joining us. Well. <laughs> all right. Well, now let's check in with meteorologist Angie Laxman. Yeah, her Labor Day forecast may determine how chaotic mm -hmm. your weekend is. Hey, Angie. Hey, guys. If anyone has a, a video of Joe sprinting through the airport, <laughs> feel free to DM it to I me on so social fast, media. Cameras I was so couldn't even capture. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Let's talk about exactly what the travel might look like today. The good news is across parts of the Midwest, the Northeast, really even the middle of the country, not a lot going on that's going to slow you down on the roads or even in the air. We do have some showers and maybe even some thunderstorms that will track across parts of the Gulf Coast here as we get through the next, unfortunately, couple of days. And some of that, uh, you know, monsoon kind of stormy conditions that are going to settle in across parts of the Southwest, too. Here's the area along the Gulf Coast. That's the, the system that we're going to be watching kind of just hang around and be a bit of a nuisance for folks in this area here as we get through not just our, our Friday, but our Saturday, our Sunday, potentially even into our Labor Day as well. It's we're going to bring some heavy downpours. And unfortunately, some of those spots that already had a, a lot of rain from Adalia in the past couple of days are going to see the potential for some flooding concerns. You can see it extends all the way across parts of the Big Bend area as we gear up for maybe another inch or possibly two inches across that region through at least Saturday. So just just a heads up there. I know a lot of folks are cleaning up, even as far south as Tampa, the St. Pete 
St. Petersburg area and points north up into places like Perry, dealing with, of course, that cleanup in the wake of Adalia. But we have some additional rainfall that, that may inhibit some of that. So keep updated on that. Meanwhile, out towards the southwest, there's those showers in, that I mentioned. We're going to have upwards of potentially three inches in some spots. The more widespread areas of, of, of rain are going to be closer to about a half an inch. So be aware of that. But it could interrupt some of those afternoon plans for you here uh, if you're planning on getting out the door for folks for any of those activities during the holiday weekend. Uh, we do have flash flood warnings in effect for parts of Arizona, California, and extending into Nevada. So just keep that in mind. Otherwise, in the Northeast, guys, I'm happy to report for Saturday, gorgeous conditions. We're into early September now. I don't know where the time went, but we're really going to feel quite nice. In the middle of the country and into parts of the Midwest, especially on Sunday, it'll be quite hot. We're talking record heat. Places like Minneapolis will see high 90s, and that'll stretch all the way down into the southern plains where we'll be into, yes, the high 90s. But unfortunately for folks in southern Texas, triple digits as well. The rain sticks around for the Gulf Coast too, but plenty of sunshine on Sunday for, again, the eastern third of the country, really. And a hot holiday forecast for folks in that same region. We'll see the heavy rain kind of move into parts of uh, the, the uh, northern plains and along the Gulf Coast. We'll still see the stormy conditions. Those are the two kind of trouble spots if you're flying in and out of those areas, mm -hmm. the southwest, the Gulf Coast. You're going to want to maybe check check your airlines. Otherwise, really nice conditions. I'm, I'm happy to report. We Love will the take graphic. it. September beauty. <laughs> you, I put those words on there. Like you and lots of sun. Hot holiday. I love them. I also can't believe it's September. Yeah. I, where did the time go? I know. Ugh, like summer is here gorgeous here. Right. Oh, well, my goodness. No. It's summer weather, so yeah. at least we have that. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Angie. Thank right. you. See you in a bit. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Coming up, he is the star of Blue Beetle. Now, actor Shola Maradueña is flipping the script with his music debut. Here our conversation on that later this hour. Up first, though, after the break, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell medically cleared after his most recent health scare. We'll bring you the latest when we come back. Welcome back. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has been given the green light to return to work one day after appearing to freeze up again during a public event in Kentucky. The attending physician for the U.S. Capitol medically cleared the 81-year-old Kentucky senator to continue working. But many people, including some fellow Republicans, are asking for more details about McConnell's health. Let's bring in NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin for the latest here. Hey, Julie, good morning. So, look, McConnell is the longest-serving leader in Senate history. What do we know about this return to work? What are we learning from the physician who attended to him, especially since this is the second time now we've seen this publicly? Yeah, 16 years as leader, 17 years in the Senate, so uh, seven terms, excuse me, in the Senate. So obviously McConnell has been at the top of power in the Republican Party for a long time. Now there are a lot of questions when it comes to his health. We knew that his team had said he would consult with a doctor before his next event. That's exactly what he seemed to do. The Capitol attending physician, Brian Monahan, let's be clear, he did not see McConnell personally, but he did say he consulted with not only the leader, but also with his neurology team, releasing a statement yesterday saying in part, quote, occasional lightheadedness is not uncommon in concussion recovery and can also be expected as a result of dehydration. Remember, McConnell had fallen in March. He was out for more than a month because of a concussion he suffered. He also suffered from, from some broken ribs. There are more questions, though, as to why McConnell keeps freezing up as he did uh, this week, as he did at the end of July when the Capitol Hill press corps, including myself, last saw him during that leadership press conference. And we do expect those questions to continue, Savannah, especially as McConnell gets back to work next week and faces his 48 Republican colleagues. Yeah, exactly. And Julie, I think that's kind of part of the key here, right, is Republicans as well expressing concern about his health. And also, I think another big question is just the transparency from his office. What more can you tell us about calls for more information about what might be going on behind the scenes or maybe what's just not happening right in front of a camera, but does exist as a concern? It, absolutely. And we already know, as NBC reported first, that McConnell suffered an additional fall in July at an airport a couple of miles away from the Capitol in D.C. His office was not up front about that until we had reported it initially. So it just goes to show you some of those transparency issues that we have a hard time getting from his office. You can imagine Republicans, though, 
also have some questions, and we spoke to some of them uh, who wanted to speak on condition of anonymity. They did not want to go on record when talking about McConnell's condition or questioning some of these transparency issues, but certainly they have them, and it's because of McConnell's position in Republican leadership. He plays a heavy role in all kinds of uh, legislative effort. He also is one of the most tactical members of the Senate, right? He plays a really expanded role, especially when it comes to the government funding showdown we are mm -hmm. expected to see in September. That said, though, his team has been doing a really careful job in trying to present him as somebody who is still in contact with members of his leadership team. Yesterday, he called the top Republican appropriator in the Senate when she had tweeted, Susan Collins, uh, that he is ready to take care of Senate business next week. So you could see this kind of PR work that his right. office and his team are trying to portray, uh, but certainly a lot of questions from Republicans, especially behind the scenes. And Julie, some of them are even going as far as to openly say that he should resign from office. Tell us about that. What exactly are kind of some of the extreme calls that we're hearing? Well, look, some of those calls are coming from those not exactly big fans of McConnell. That includes Marjorie Taylor Greene, the congresswoman in the House, who qu uh, questioned his mental fitness for office. We also heard from other sort of these Trump-allied Republicans. Of course, the former president and McConnell do not have a good relationship, and that is no secret on the public stage as well. But, all, but this does, of course, continue to call into question if he's ready to serve as leader after this term, right? He has, uh, he's in the Senate term until 2026. He's going to stay on as leader until at least 2025. We know that from McConnell and from key allies we spoke to, including this week. Uh, but certainly there are key questions as to whether he's going to be challenged for a leadership position uh, when it comes to that next leadership term. Julia Serkin, a lot more to come here. We know you will stay on it. Thank you so much. Harrowing stories are emerging after yesterday's catastrophic fire in Johannesburg. Flames engulfed a five-story derelict building, killing more than 70 people. South Africa's president is calling the deadly inferno a great tragedy and is promising a full investigation. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley has the latest. You could hear the screams coming from inside the inferno. A fearsome fire engulfing a five-story building in Johannesburg, killing at least 74 people including 12 children. The building had been abandoned and was filled with an estimated 200 homeless squatters. Witnesses say exits out of the building were blocked. The massive blaze forced some to do the unthinkable. My in-law, she just to hit the window and to throw the door outside. The government facing fierce criticism. It's a wake-up call for us to begin to address the situation of housing in the inner city. But reforms will come too late for these homeless victims for whom there was no place left to go but the streets and now nothing left to feel. <laughs> South Africa's president pledged to root out those criminal gangs that had taken control of that abandoned building and to launch an investigation into what exactly caused this deadly fire. Matt Bradley, NBC News. More international news now. Police in Ecuador have made several arrests after a car bombing in the country's capital. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackie Freyer has that in other world news for us. Hey, good morning, Janice. Hey, good morning. We begin in Ecuador with a series of car bombings and more than 50 law enforcement officers being taken hostage inside prisons. Now, this comes just three weeks after the assassination of a presidential candidate there, something that shook the country. Authorities have arrested six people in connection with the bombings. They say there were no injuries, uh, but they also point to the spiraling violence between criminal groups and cartels. For the first time, Pope Francis is visiting Mongolia, arriving today to the tiny and relatively new Catholic community there. He will spend uh, four days mostly in the capital. This is a politically sensitive visit, though, with Mongolia sitting between Russia and China. The Pope's plane passed through Chinese airspace, which afforded the pontiff a rare opportunity to send a greeting to Chinese President Xi Jinping. And finally, how do you get five million angry bees off a road? It's a legit question. Uh, about an hour southwest of Toronto, Canada, and beekeepers from all over the area helped answer the call. They swarmed to help. <laughs> uh, when hives fell off a truck and first responders didn't know how to respond. Uh, it was a dangerous situation, but a weirdly funny one too. That officials say took a few hours to 
resolve. <laughs> and that nice to is a look there, at your Janice. headlines and all of the bee puns <laughs> that I could possibly pull up for you today. That I love was that. very sweet. I'm captivated by the like bee corner of TikTok which exists oh. to watch people who are comfortable dealing with them. It's like fascinating. Yeah. So there you go. Or a horror movie depending yeah. on who you yeah. are. All right. Janice, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, the White House working to close a controversial loophole when it comes to buying guns. Up next, the major move just announced that would impact Pack who can buy a gun at gun shows. Stay with us. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. The White House is taking a big step aimed at reducing gun violence. The Biden administration will propose a new rule to eliminate the so-called gun show loophole. While well, licensed gun stores must conduct background checks on all customers, a vast number of private sales take place without the background check at places like gun shows. This loophole has been cited for years as a major flaw in the federal background check system. NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now with more on this. Ali, good morning. So the Biden administration says a new law passed last year after that mass shooting tragedy in Uvalde, Texas. That clears the way to implement this new rule. So remind us what that law is that was passed and then how this new rule will work. Yeah, Joe, so to take you back to last summer, momentum had been building after the mass shootings in Buffalo, New York, as well as Uvalde, Texas, for some substantive, substantive rather, gun legislation, which hadn't been passed in around three decades on Capitol Hill. And after lots of tough negotiations across the aisle, the end result was the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And in that legislation was a provision that tightened the definition of what it technically means to be a gun dealer in the United States. It used to be that dealing guns had to make up the majority of your income and your livelihood to be considered a gun dealer. Uh, but the Biden administration aimed to broaden out that definition to encompass really anyone selling guns guns for a profit. And doing so, they say, will allow them to close that so-called gun show loophole, which, of course, as you mentioned, only allowed the ATF to regulate background checks uh, that for people buying guns from licensed gun dealers, uh, but people who were not subject to those background checks were the people buying them online or at gun shows, at flea markets and the like. So this is a major change. If it does get approved to gun legislation, uh, it's likely to be challenged by Second Amendment uh, ad activists. But the Biden administration is saying they can defend this because of that new language, that new provision in this bill. So for right now, we wait for the ATF to review this proposal that begins with a public commenting period that could take sometimes up to a year, uh, and it could be delayed even further if this is legally challenged, Joe. A big question is, is this the most the Biden administration can do? We know the president has been a strong advocate for a more ambitious law that would just ban assault weapons, but that still faces very strong opposition in Congress, right? That's right. But the current makeup of Congress, there's really no realistic scenario in which that would pass. And the president has a long history of trying to get gun legislation across the finish line. Remember when he was vice president after the Sandy Hook shooting, uh, he really took the lead on negotiations with Capitol Hill to be able to get universal background checks passed. And that also failed. So for now, all he can do uh, is issue these proposals to the rules that have already passed and issue, uh, as we've seen him do before, these executive orders to essentially be able to make sure that things have that have already passed in the law are working at full capacity. So for right now, this is really all he can do, Joe. All right. Ali Rafa at the White House. Thank you. This morning, there are serious concerns in Mississippi over the state's public defender system. Legal experts say the system is underfunded and fails to provide counsel for people who cannot afford their own. It's an issue that in some cases mean people spend months or even years behind bars waiting for legal representation, and sometimes for a crime they did not even commit. NBC News correspondent Aaron Gilchrist talked to one man who went through just that, stuck in the so-called dead zone. Dwayne Lake spent six years in a Mississippi jail accused of triple murder, and all that time was before he went to trial and was found not guilty. In Mississippi, you're definitely guilty until you prove yourself innocent. Lake says he had to wait to be formally indicted for years before getting what the Constitution guarantees, a court-appointed defense attorney dedicated to his case. I'm not even in the court system. I'm just being held by the sheriff department on the allegations. For two years? For two years, I'm basically sitting in jail without legal representation, 
no attorney to help me, no pretrial motions, no pre-indictment motions, none of those things. Lake fell into what the legal community has called the dead zone, the time between arrest and indictment for people who can't afford their own lawyer. It's a problem rooted in Mississippi's multi-tier public defense crisis. Today, there are about 32 full-time public defenders across all of the state's 82 counties. We need 130 to 135 full-time equivalent attorneys, and half of those should be full-time lawyers. Andre Degree runs the Mississippi State Public Defender Office. He says the part-time lawyers hired by local courts, who often still have their own private practices, are simply overwhelmed. In most places, they have way more cases than they could reasonably handle, and then they have no support staff. Outside of death penalty and appeals cases, the state of Mississippi is one of only five that do not fund a defense for people who can't afford their own lawyers. Here, individual counties bear the burden of funding and running their own programs. Degree says it's a responsibility the state should be taking on. I don't think the problem is ever going to be solved until we get state general funds to even that out. Manpower and money aren't the only challenges for a state where 85% of those charged with felonies can't afford a lawyer, according to the MacArthur Justice Center at the University of Mississippi. I suspect that Mississippi has the least effective and the least robust public defender system in America. Cliff Johnson runs the MacArthur Center and told me there are no rules to force the wheels of justice to turn quickly for people who are accused but not yet charged. In some of these counties, you only have a grand jury twice a year. So if the grand jury comes up and the officer who worked your case is at Dollywood on vacation with his family and they bump you over to the next grand jury, you just got six months more in jail. Johnson would like to see limits on how long a district attorney can hold someone without bringing formal charges. Right now, there are none. You don't have a lawyer. You don't have money to get out on bail. You don't have anybody fighting for you, and you don't have judges who are willing to look at the DA and say, I'm not going to hold this guy for six months, a year, a year and a half, while you get your stuff together to go to the grand jury. Local and state prosecutors didn't respond to our request for comment, but this year the state public defender and other advocates helped secure new regulations from the Mississippi Supreme Court. They mandate that initial appearance defenders stay with clients through the dead zone. It's a small step forward. It's a really important question for all of us. Are we committed to the system of justice we say we believe in? Now at 37, Dwayne Lake, finally a free man, moved out of the state, slowly rebuilding his life in Louisville, Kentucky, and working to reconnect with his three young kids. You decided you just couldn't stay in Mississippi? I couldn't. I feel as if, uh, especially now, it's target on my back. I'm still focused, trying to get back in my kid's life. You know, I mean, I'm not where I want to be at, but I'm working towards it. Our thanks to Aaron Gilchrist for that report. Legal experts say the state's mandate from the Mississippi Supreme Court would shrink the dead zone. But others say there's multiple factors that lead to these long wait times. Coming up, they are called kid fluencers, children with social media accounts with millions of views. But critics say some are being exploited and that one state is working to stop it. We'll explain. Plus, they are changing the game with their record-breaking game attendance. Now, hear from the women's volleyball team at the University of Nebraska about what went into their history-making moment. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. All across the country, conversations are playing out about how to best protect kids from the worst effects of social media. And yeah, but now one state is zeroing in on parents, making serious money on the backs of children. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the story. Ooh, animated. Each of the kids receive one dollar. They are a fun and entertaining way. In an era when social media influencers can rake in substantial paychecks and clips of cute kids garner millions of views, one state is giving laws against exploitation a modern makeover. Essentially, the state of Illinois is going after the money. Yes. Illinois this month became the first state to amend its child labor laws, adding protections for so-called kid fluencers. The new law, spearheaded by State Senator Dave Kaler, entitles kids under 16, featured in 30% of an adult's paid posts over a 30-day period, to a percentage of that money when they turn 18. If the adult fails to pay, the law gives the child grounds to sue. This is now a business. We're talking millions of dollars in some cases. 
then we need to set up some protection for the, for the child. The move source, an Illinois teen bothered by videos of toddlers flooding her feed. They're doing dances on TikTok, but also they're having vlogs of them crying. As we start to see these kids grow up, they're going to tell us their stories about the exploitation that's happened. The bill mirrors a nearly century old law protecting young Hollywood stars and named for silent film child actor Jackie Coogan, who claimed his parents squandered his earnings. My first time not taking concrete with me to get my hair done. Bobby Altoff hopes more states adopt this modern take. She used to post paid content of her daughter, but stopped after reading vicious comments. She says influencer friends who feature their kids favor regulation. I think you should be able to just post and make your career off of your children. A real world debate over the kids growing up on our screens. Maggie Vespa, NBC News. Some financial headlines now. It looks like contract talks are heating up between the United Auto Workers Union and some major car manufacturers. CNBC reporter Pippa Stevens has that and other money news for us. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. The UAW is accusing General Motors and Chrysler's parents Stellantis of not bargaining in good faith just two weeks before contracts with the automakers expire. The UAW's president says the union has filed a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board. Unlike past union leaders, Sean Fain has been more public in airing details of the contract talks. He's leading negotiations for new four-year deals for about 146,000 hourly workers at GM, Ford and Stellantis and has said the union is prepared to strike. Tesla unveils the first revamp of its popular Model 3 sedan with a sleeker look and longer range of more than 600 miles. The updated version has a 17-speaker sound system, customizable ambient lighting, and an 8-inch touchscreen for passengers in the back seat. The new Model 3 is available for now just in China with a price tag of under $36,000, which is 12% more than the older models. Separately, Tesla is cutting prices on the Model S and X and reducing the price of its full self-driving feature by $3,000. And a tropical island in the Caribbean is sitting on a digital gold mine. The British territory of Anguilla has been in charge of assigning internet addresses that end in .ai to residents and businesses since the 1990s. With a boom in activity surrounding artificial intelligence, it is now cashing in. The total number of domain registrations ending with AI has doubled in the past year. And it's estimated Anguilla will bring in $300 million in fees this year. I'm sure that office got really busy really fast. Yeah. <laughs> That's so like, true. Wow, all these requests yeah. for our web addresses. My goodness. All right, Pippa, thanks so much. Thanks, Pippa. Well, yesterday we told you about the University of Nebraska Huskers women's volleyball team smashing the world record for attendance at a women's sporting event on Wednesday night. Well, our own Jesse Kerr spoke with the team to get their take on that historic moment and how it all came to be. In a sea of red, they cheered by the tens of thousands. The University of Nebraska Lincoln's faithful fans, a capacity crowd, filling the school's football stadium. But this was for an entirely different kind of game. Has it set in for you guys what's happened? I don't think so, no. <laughs> I agree. It's still surreal. Welcome to Volleyball Day in Nebraska, an outdoor celebration culminating with a clean sweep win for the Nebraska women's team and a worldwide first. Memorial Stadium's official attendance was 92,003. The Cornhuskers say that's a new world record for attendance at a women's sporting event. It's also bigger than any football crowd that's ever filled this century-old stadium. Junior libero Lexi Rodriguez says she couldn't stop smiling. It was something bigger than just a volleyball game, and it's going to go down in history, and I think it's putting volleyball and women's sports on a bigger map. Four-time national champion coach John Cook says this all started with a far simpler goal, reclaim the attendance record from another school. Problem is, their indoor arenas weren't big enough. So this started with you trying to just hit around 20,000 people is what you're telling me. I would have been ecstatic with 20,000 people in the stadium, but it's the only place we could hold a volleyball match and, and to get the record back. But the Cornhuskers spiked 20,000 
and then some. This wouldn't happen anywhere else in the world, really. Like, volleyball is the, you know, Nebraska's the epicenter for volleyball and for the sport. I kept reminding everyone to just enjoy the moment and to soak it all in. A one-of-a-kind spectacle making history and setting the bar high. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News. What a crowd. I love that. 2000. It's incredible. Volleyball is big in Nebraska. Yeah, oh, my wow. goodness. So cool for those women. All right, coming up, you might know him as the Blue Beetle, but actor Sholo Maradueña wants you to know he is so much more. When we come back, I'm going to share our conversation about his other passion, hip hop, as he makes his music debut. We are flipping the script next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Well, you might have thought Barbenheimer was an unusual double feature. Well, listen to what nearly happened that might be even stranger. Xer Swift. This is the nickname people started using when they spotted that Taylor Swift's Eras Tour movie that was just announced yesterday was going to be released on the same day in October as The Exorcist Believer. But before anybody could sign up for a double bill of, of course, Taylor's fabulous music and demonic possession, The Exorcist movie's release date changed. So that's not going to come out a week earlier, October 6th. Taylor is going to get that coveted Friday the 13th slot. 13 is, of course, her favorite number, and she does nothing on accident. Of course, we're going to be talking about this more because the Ayers movie is a huge deal, which we're so excited about. So in our next hour, we'll have more. I mean, Joe, can you just, how funny is that? And also the fact that a horror movie in October moved their date from the 13th because yeah. they know what us Swifties are going to do. That is the power of Taylor, <laughs> my goodness. Yeah. Even the exorcist is scared. All right. <laughs> All right. Exactly. Thanks, Savannah. <laughs> now to our series, Flipping the Script, featuring people on screen, on stage, and behind the scenes, and in the music world, shining a spotlight on diversity. Enter Sholo Maradueña, the actor just made history. He is the first Latin lead in a DC superhero movie. Sholo plays Jaime Reyes in the new movie, the hit movie, Blue Beetle. And now, at just 22 years, old, he's taking on a new challenge, the music world. I sat down with the Los Angeles native to discuss his new song and his love of 90s hip-hop. We should note, because of the ongoing actor strike, we did not discuss Blue Beetle or any of his other acting roles. We focused our conversation on the music. Cholo, you have a new single out. What can you tell us about it? I can tell you it's called On My Way with Adriana Padilla. It's inspired by the hip hop and some of the music that I was listening to growing up. If you headed to the top, this the song to play. You got a good girl, listen to the song today and envision all of your problems getting blown away. It's got some serious 90s vibes, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the goal? Yeah. I'm not great at math, but okay. I'm pretty sure you weren't born in the 90s. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wasn't born in the 90s, but it's funny that you say that. So my mom, my mom uh, was in the radio industry in the late 90s, early 2000s. In the, in the hip hop world, so as soon as like day three on this planet, I had, you know, Tribe Called Quest, 90s, Outcast, like in my head, in my veins. So your mom was a radio show host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did that influence your love of music? I think it really helped widen my, my, the, the type of music that I listened to at a young age, whether it was jazz or like music from Mexico or hip hop and stuff like that. So I think that really helped shape the world view. What does mom think of the song? I don't know. Mom is always, she'll always say everything is great. So, so she thinks, of course, she, she loves it. Mom does like it. I think. I haven't asked her explicitly. I, I, maybe I should. Maybe I bet she likes it. Yes, I'm confident yeah, yeah. that she likes it. This is, I mean, in what ways do you feel like you're paying homage to some of your favorite yes. artists from the past? Definitely paying homage. I listen to music every single day and, and hip-hop alike, 90s hip-hop alike. So when it came to, you know, what is the first song that I want to make, it was what, what feels the most comfortable to me. I think um, sometimes when we see people who are actors also get into the music business, mm -hmm. Fans may wonder, like, why do you want to do all those things? Why is it so important to add this to your resume? It wasn't really about adding it to the resume. I think sound and music is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful form of, of getting someone to hear a message. And I really think that there's, right now, there's a lot of messages that need to be put out there. And I'm really excited to, to, um, to you know, really dig more into it and see you know, where this 
where do, where do the cookie crumbles? Where are the where, where are the <laughs> what is the, the fr- cookie how crumbles? The, yeah, how where the, the dominoes yeah, okay. fall? I don't I don't know what the phrase <laughs> I was looking for. The way I think you've got the name for your next yeah. song there. You said yeah. you want to go deeper. I mean, what yeah. type of music do you want to be doing looking forward? I want to make music that is reflective of my experiences and and the communities that I grew up in, the people that I listened to growing up. There's always a, there was always a necessity there to make music. There was always a story that needed to be told. And, and I got a story right now that, that I think um, that I would like to tell. And what is that story you want people to know? I grew up in El Sereno, you know, one of the most Latino, you know, cities in the country. And, and there's so many different stories to tell there, so many beautiful colors and, and narratives that, that, that belong in a community. And, and I think at the end of the day, I want to bring up everyone in my community with me. I think that's, that's the story that, that gets told, is that we can, we can rise up together. What's the biggest advice you have for young people who want to follow in your footsteps? It was the advice that my mama gave me. I think it's just like, it's when it will hit. It's not if it'll hit. It really made me believe that I could do anything. And eventually, it happened. And it was years in. It wasn't like days in, right? I think really that was the most helpful advice. When you want to do something, especially in the arts, you can. You can definitely do it, yeah. And that is how the cookie crumbles. That's how the cookie crumbles. That's right. We fully recognize that is not how you use that expression. (laughs) All our thanks to Sholo for taking the time to talk with us. You can check out his new single, On My Way, on Spotify and Apple Music. I love he said the advice my mama gave me. He definitely loves his mom. He was fantastic. Great interview. All right, thank you. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Good morning. Happy Friday. We made it. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, one last hurrah. It is one of the busiest travel weekends of the year and a sure sign that summer is coming to a close. Labor Day. Nearly 100 million Americans are set to hit the road in the coming days. 14 million are expected to take to the skies. We've got all you need to know as you head out the door, including that all-important weekend forecast. Also this morning, a not guilty plea from former President Trump in that election interference case out of Georgia. His legal team confirming he's waiving his right to show up for his arraignment next week. So what does that mean for his legal future? We're going to dig deeper. Plus, picking up the pieces, there is jaw-dropping new drone footage this morning showing the sheer devastation left throughout the South in Adalia's wake. The video comes as federal officials hit the ground to assess the damage. The President Biden set to visit Florida tomorrow. Plus, TikTok creators are giving their followers a front row seat to the aftermath. We're covering it all. And it's a new era for none other than Taylor Swift as she moves from the big stage to the big screen with her blockbuster Eras tour now heading to a theater near you. I think you're going to see that, right? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I know. My fourth time at the Air Store will be in the theater. <laughs> we'll be on Friday uh, the 13th. It's so cool. The thing is, is this because the truth is I've been three times. It's very exciting to think about actually getting to see like every dance move, every facial expression because you're just in the theater. Oh, I assume behind the scenes stuff, yeah. right? Okay. I don't know because oh. the runtime is a little bit shorter oh. than okay. the concert. So. Never, I don't know. I know. There we go. Right. We'll get into More it. More on that in a little bit. This morning <laughs> we're kicking off the Labor Day weekend as millions of Americans are expected to hit the roads and take to the skies. Yeah, while those travel numbers are expected to reach record levels, there could be some delays up ahead. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello joins us now with what to expect if you are planning on getting away for that last taste of summer. Yeah, good morning. Think about the numbers here. More than 100 million people are traveling over the Labor Day weekend. That means roughly a third of the country is traveling. It is going to be very busy. People on the roads and also in the airports. Where, However you travel, you're going to have a lot of company. It's that last big getaway of the summer. Millions of Americans driving into a busy travel weekend ahead. I'm expecting a lot of traffic. We expect, yeah, a lot more people, a lot more crowds, uh, especially with a long weekend. AAA says bookings for domestic travel, including flights, hotels, rental cars, and cruises, are up 4% since Labor Day last year, and a whopping 44% rise in international bookings, with top destinations including Vancouver, Rome, London, Dublin, and Paris. With an estimated 95 million Americans expected to travel in the coming days, experts say the best times to avoid heavy traffic are in the evening and the early morning, right? 
right about now. The longer you wait during the rest of the day, more people are just going to be filtering on the road. So if you can get a good jump start on the holiday, you'll be out ahead of the crowd. Some cities with typically heavy traffic are expected to be even more congested than usual, including L.A., Seattle, Houston, Atlanta, and Boston. It takes us three hours. It takes us three hours. We're there for the weekend. We'll have a good, good old time. So some travelers are planning ahead. And then we're actually going to go back on Sunday, so we're not dealing with the Monday traffic. And with the roads expected to be packed, experts are urging motorists to drive with patience to avoid what's become a nationwide problem, road rage. A new survey finds the most confrontational drivers are in Arizona, followed by Rhode Island, West Virginia, Virginia, and Oklahoma. If you're looking for polite drivers, head to Delaware. They're nice there. And many drivers are getting a break at the gas pump. Average gas prices now $3.82 a gallon per AAA. That's close to the same time a year ago. Meanwhile, the holiday rush is on at the airports. The TSA expecting to screen more than 14 million passengers this weekend. It was not your imagination. If you were flying this summer and the airports were packed, TSA says they screened 227 million passengers, the most ever, two and a half million a day. I just checked, only 42 flight cancellations today nationwide so far, so it's mm. looking like a pretty good day to fly. And if you're driving, Get out on the roads early. Guys, yeah. back to you. Cool. Wow, it's looking busy already. Tom Costello, thank you so much. Shout out to the friendly drivers of Delaware. <laughs> right. Temperatures could <laughs> be heating polite. up for some parts of the country. <laughs> Meteorologist Angie Lassman is here with your holiday weekend forecast. Hey, Angie. <laughs> hey there, guys. Uh, we're rolling into, into the unofficial last weekend of summer, but boy, it, it doesn't look like it if you look into the middle of the country where temperatures are well over the 90s, uh, in, well over that 90 degree mark. I should say Omaha, Minneapolis, Rapid City, Denver, you really name it and we're more than 10 degrees above normal for this time of year for this region. Yesterday was the last official day of meteorological summer. Today, the first official day of, sol, but, of fall. But of course, again, it, it really isn't going to start to settle into those kind of fall-like temperatures anytime soon for folks in this area. We've got Milwaukee headed to 90 degrees tomorrow, 95 for Des Moines. We'll potentially see some records across this region with Minneapolis again heading to the mid-90s and Rapid City likely to hit 100 degrees tomorrow. If we look ahead to your Sunday, Monday, Tuesday forecast, across parts of the Midwest and the Northeast. We'll start to see that heat spreading a little farther to the east slowly but surely. In the meantime, across the Northeast, today, even tomorrow, really nice and actually comfortable conditions, perfect for any of those outdoor plans you may have. But just be, be mindful that if you're headed out to the coast, you could see some rip current issues and some high surf for folks on the East Coast. Otherwise, Cleveland heads to the upper 80s by the time we get into Sunday and into Monday, Nashville into the low 90s. And we're rolling through September with warmer than average temperatures. This is what we're likely going to see. That outlook came out for the month ahead. And you can see it's the same kind of region that we're dealing with that uh, abnormally warm conditions right now. That's going to continue. And so will the drier than average conditions for that same region, too. Now, looking at the Atlantic. I I know this is probably not what you guys want to see because we've been Ooh. talking so much about the tropics, but we are getting into September. That is uh, the peak of hurricane season. So we've got a whole lot going on out there. Luckily, right now, at least none of this is going to impact us in the short term. We'll, of course, be keeping a close eye on it here as we get through the next couple of days. But a good reminder, of course, that, uh, again, it is the peak of hurricane season. So uh, it, it bears having a, at least a plan ready in case. Oh, exactly. absolutely. As we, of course, just saw this yeah, week. Angie, exactly. thank you so much. Turning now to the legal battles facing former President Donald Trump in Georgia. Yesterday, Trump pleaded not guilty to charges that include racketeering and conspiracy in the case of an alleged attempt to overturn the 2020 election in that state. Trump's lawyers made the plea in writing. That means the president will not have to attend next week's arraignment in person. Let's bring in David Henderson. He is a civil rights attorney and former prosecutor. David, good to have you with us. So no surprise that Trump is pleading not guilty once again. That's one of the first steps, though, in a trial process. Help us understand the reasons why the former president waived his arraignment. Are there legal benefits to this, or is this maybe more of a PR thing? Well, first, good to see you again, too, Joe, Savannah, this morning. Basically, the reason he waived his arraignment, this is the least surprising thing that's happened out of any of his legal woes so far. The only thing that happens at an arraignment is you basically step up to the counter, and the judge asks, all right, what'll it be? Because the judge doesn't know. Are you going to plead guilty? 
Do you already have a deal worked out with the prosecutor? The real question the judge wants answered is, do we need a trial here? The answer there is yes. And so by doing this in writing instead of appearing in court, we already know that's the way things are going to move forward. What I think was a smart move for this team, though, is it avoided any spectacle of cameras being in the courtroom, catching them doing something that's going to make headlines for them in a bad way, which is highly likely every time they step inside of a courtroom. Yeah, and that reminds us this is the one case right now of all the cases that Trump is involved with where cameras are in the courtroom. So, David, I want to ask you about a push by some right wing Georgia state lawmakers to impeach the prosecutor, Fulton County's district attorney, Fonnie Willis. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, who we should point out is a Republican, addressed that yesterday. First, let's hear what he had to say. I have not seen any evidence that D.A. Willis's actions or lack thereof warrant action by the prosecuting attorney oversight commission. A special session of the General Assembly to end run around this law is not feasible and may ultimately prove to be unconstitutional. As long as I'm governor, we're going to follow the law and the Constitution, regardless of who it helps or harms politically. So that's the Republican governor weighing in. David, what do you make of this effort to possibly impeach Willis? Is there any legal merit to this, in your opinion? In short, no. It's actually hard for me to answer this question with a straight face. But there are two things we have to look at first. Number one, it lets you know that they know there's a likelihood that President Trump will be convicted high enough for them to want to just get Fonnie Willis off the case altogether, because that's the only way they can stop this train. It also raises two huge issues that aren't immediately apparent. And the first one is voter suppression for the people of Fulton County. DAs are elected or they're appointed by elected people. Fulton County elected Fonnie Willis. They're entitled to have her enforcing the law in Fulton County. But it also raises the issue of equity because one thing you have to give Fonnie Willis credit for is she has always used RICO. It's like Thor with his hammer. This is her tool. And they didn't have any problem with how she dropped it until she looked to drop it on former President Trump. So trying to impeach her is going to force a conversation about how inequitably the law is actually applied and when people step in to try to save individuals that they just don't want to see prosecuted. All right. David Henderson, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Now to the aftermath of Hurricane Adalia. Shocking new drone footage from Florida's Big Bend region is giving us a bird's eye view of the destruction there. Look at this. Federal officials are working in partnership with local and state officials to assess the damage, but it's expected to take days before we truly know the extent of it all. President Biden is set to travel to Florida tomorrow. This comes as authorities in Georgia confirm that the storm has claimed a third life. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from Horseshoe Beach, Florida, with the latest on all this. Hi, Maggie. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. You kind of put it perfectly right then that this is kind of coming into focus. I mean, this is one of those communities that was cut off initially. We got access to it yesterday. And look at the damage here in Horseshoe Beach. I mean, this was a house. And now you can see it's basically just cement pillars with that metal roofing on top. We have a drone above overhead. I want to show you that view. You can see basically parts of this entire block look similarly. There's like pockets of destruction next to homes that are just intact. Basically, the level of damage here is far beyond anything else that we had seen so far. This morning, in the wake of Idalia's deadly wrath, a stunning new look at coastal Florida communities utterly decimated by the historic hurricane. Entire blocks torn to shreds when the Category 3 made landfall Wednesday, with pieces of homes scattered and trucks submerged in murky water. We didn't expect it to be this bad. Before and after satellite photos showing the storm's destruction in Florida. President Biden, who on Thursday thanked staff at FEMA headquarters for their response to Idalia and the Maui wildfires, will survey the damage in Florida on Saturday. To the people of Florida and throughout the southeast, uh, I'm here to make clear that our nation has your back. The president's promise coming alongside a series of updates on the struggle to recover. Seeing a lot of damage and I'm also seeing a lot of resiliency. Long lines growing with families desperate for donations and supplies. Idalia downgraded to a tropical storm Wednesday night, but still wreaked havoc in Georgia and the Carolinas, leaving behind a landscape of flooded communities. Georgia officials confirming a third hurricane-related death following two fatal car crashes in Florida during the storm, according to Florida Highway Patrol. We do have one reported fatality in Lowndes County from a tree falling on a vehicle. We are certainly keeping the family in our thoughts. 
Meanwhile, images of Floridians who opted not to evacuate going viral. This man enjoying a beer in his recliner, even though his living room is flooded. For Deborah Mims in Hard Hit Perry, she heard this massive tree come crashing down while she rode out the storm in her home. Realize you do, you're stronger than you think you are. And then you walk outside and you're like, oh wow, I made it through. I didn't, you know, die. Yeah, a lot of people having that surreal realization. By the way, back out here live, you can see that drone shot again, just stunning damage here in Horseshoe Beach. Uh, perhaps based on what you're seeing, no surprise, still power outages, uh, close to 130,000 combined across Florida and Georgia, so crews working on that. Also of note, as bad as this looks, as bad as this is, no confirmed deaths here in this community. Uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis saying yesterday that he took that as confirmation that people heeded the warnings, took this storm seriously, which is good. And then, by the way, guys, one final note. As far as President Biden's visit tomorrow is concerned, we don't yet know which community mm. he's planning to see. But again, that is set for tomorrow. I'll wow. send it back to you. Wow, just stunning, that live drone image. Maggie Vespa, thank you so much. Gary LeBlanc, founder and CEO of Mercy Chefs, joins us now. Starting today, they will be on the ground serving hot meals to community members, first responders, volunteers, anyone who needs it. Gary, it's good to see you again because I know that we actually spoke with you in the wake of what happened in Lahaina, the wildfires there, and now your organization here on the ground. Tell us how you prepare for each deployment and what you're doing right now to get ready to serve these communities in Florida. Well, we have our large Ford deployed warehouse up outside of Huntsville, uh, Alabama. And so we moved our team Tuesday down to Tallahassee. Uh, we weathered the storm. And then Wednesday, we began moving in. Um, it was a hard go. We had to uh, travel through where the eye actually came through. So lots of trees down and tangled power lines. But our team was able to get in. Here it's a live oak. Uh, we set up uh, Wednesday, and then yesterday we began feeding people. And so Mercy Chefs has been on the ground here in Live Oak, taking care of the feeding needs of the folks here. How many meals do you expect to serve each day during your time in Florida? What do you know so far about the need for this? Well, yesterday, our first day, we were able to get out 4,000 hot chef-prepared wow. meals while we were still setting up. Today, we're targeting about 10,000, and we'll continue to ramp up to whatever number is needed. Wow, up to 10,000 a day. It's incredible. Um, Gary, I know you and your wife founded Mercy Chefs back in 2006, and that was after Hurricane Katrina had devastated your hometown of New Orleans. Nearly 20 years later, you are helping Hurricane Adalia victims. What does it mean to you to be able to help people in their time of need and also to be watching people going through what you went through 20 years ago? Well, I don't know how I could do anything else. I mean, if there's any humanity inside of a person, they have to come and help. We believe that amazing things happen over a shared meal. It's what I did my whole career. And I get to go do that now with folks that have gone through a horrible storm or lost everything. And so we're able to share that moment with them over a hot chef prepared restaurant quality meal. And we see people take that first moment to consider what's just happened to them. And so we get a lot of tears and a lot of breakdowns over those hot meals. Absolutely. It's incredible what you're doing, Gary. Incredible we're speaking to you in the wake of this after having just spoken with you from Lahaina. Thank you very much for your time again. Thank you guys for having us on. Coming up on this hour of morning news now, we're going to take a closer look at Adalia's destruction across the South through the eyes of TikTok creators who are experience, experiencing it all firsthand. But first, Buster Murdoch, the surviving son of convicted murderer Alec Murdoch, is now breaking his silence, defending his father and himself as questions swirl about another death. Those stories and more are up next. Welcome back. There is a new update this morning in the story of the Utah mother turned accused murderer. She wrote a children's book on grief after the loss of her husband, only to later be accused of killing him. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has more as the wife is set to appear in court today. Hey there, it's been over two months since Corey Richens' last court appearance. During that appearance, her sister-in-law called her an evil she never knew existed. For today's hearing, Eric's family is said to be optimistic this will move to trial, but it's not clear whether they'll be in attendance. 
So my husband passed away unexpectedly last year. This morning, a Utah wife and mother of three accused of fatally poisoning her husband is due back in court, where a judge will determine whether or not Corey Richen's case will go to trial. Richens, who's been charged with first-degree aggravated murder and three counts of possession with intent to distribute a controlled substance, has not yet entered a plea. Police arrested Richens last May, more than a year after her husband Eric's death. Sure. At the time, Richens had been promoting her new children's book on coping with grief. My kids and I kind of wrote this book on the different emotions and grieving processes that we've experienced last year. According to court documents, last March, officers discovered Eric unresponsive at the foot of his bed in the early morning hours. That night, Richens revealing to police she had made Eric a Moscow mule that he drank in bed. Upon his death, autopsy results finding he had fentanyl in his system. According to court documents, his family later telling investigators Eric believed Corey may have tried to poison him more than once, even changing his will and life insurance from his wife to his sister. Five times the lethal dose is not accidental, Your Honor. In June, prosecutors painting Richens as a calculating killer during a detention hearing and revealing new details about the Utah mom's alleged Internet activity, including searches for luxury prisons for the rich, how long does life insurance take to pay, and can the FBI find deleted text messages? There's nothing to show that... Corey did anything to Eric. It could have been accidental. A judge ultimately denying Richens bail and a pretrial release. In a case centered on a family's grief, this next hearing may be a turning point towards closure. And we're comfortable that the state has uh, put together a good case. We've reached out to Corey Richens' attorney for comment, but no response. If convicted, she faces between 25 years to life in prison without parole. Back in August, prosecutors filed a notice of intent not to seek the death penalty. Back to you. All right, Aaron McLaughlin, thank you. Well, Buster Murdoch is breaking his silence this morning, speaking out about the murders of his mother and brother and the trial that put his father behind bars. Here's NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk. This is not what I needed. In his first on-camera interview since his mother and brother were killed on their family estate in South Carolina, Buster Murdoch defends himself and his father, Alec, who is serving a life sentence for the double murder, speaking with Fox Nation. You think it was a crappy motive? And yet, 12 jurors all agreed that your dad killed your mom and pa. That's right. What do you think about that? I do not believe it was fair. Questions have swirled around Buster over a different death. Former classmate Stephen Smith, a 19-year-old whose body was discovered in 2015, on a road about 15 miles from the family property, where years later Maggie and Paul Murdoch were shot and killed. Initially ruled a hit and run, the case was reopened in the weeks after the double murder, and state law enforcement is now investigating Smith's death as a homicide. There were unsubstantiated rumors that he and Buster Murdoch were in a relationship. Murdoch has never been identified as a suspect and does not face any criminal charges. I never had anything to do with his murder and I never had anything to do with him on a physical level of, of any regard. Murdoch was at his father's trial every day, Destroying taking the stand in his defense. Happening. But this was his response in the interview when asked if he thinks his father is a psychopath. I'm not prepared to sit here and say that it encompasses him as a whole, but certainly I think there are characteristics where you look at the manipulation and the lies and the carrying out of that such, and I, I think that's a fair assessment. Alec Murdoch has gotten into some trouble in prison over this documentary. According to the Corrections Department, his attorney recorded him over the phone reading some of his journal entries. It's not a crime, but it does break prison rules. And as a result, in part from that, he has lost his phone privileges. We reached out to his attorney who would not comment on the issue, but said he had the utmost respect for the director of the Department of Corrections. Back to you. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much. Coming up, continuing coverage of the devastating aftermath of Adalia across the South. After the break, we'll show you a front row seat to the destruction through TikTok. We'll explain that next.
That was just a few of the content creators on TikTok who've been giving users a front row seat to the aftermath of Hurricane Adalia by documenting their experiences on the social media network. According to creators, the platform has, quote, been a way to get information out quickly about these areas that were greatly impacted by the storm, especially for those who chose to evacuate and weren't able to see it themselves. NBC News youth and internet culture reporter Callan Rosenblatt joins us now with more on this. Hey, Callan, good to see you. So look, I mean, I think a lot of these people were calling them creators, but I just think for of a certain age, you put things that happen to you on TikTok. And obviously this is a huge thing that's happening happening to people as their homes are being destroyed or they can't get back home and they're the ones seeing it firsthand. Tell us what ways TikTokers have been able to give this inside look at the destruction caused by Adalia. Yeah, Savannah, uh, Joe, we've seen a lot of people who have either stayed behind in areas that were evacuated, people who have had their, you know, streets flooded that are inaccessible, um, their homes have flooded. And they're recording these images and putting them on TikTok in a way that is, you know, informing people of the real damages, places where maybe we wouldn't see inside of homes. Uh, in one case, it was a house fire that people were able to film that was caused by um, an electrical malfunction. So we're really seeing this toll up close. And as you said, I mean, part of just existing now is being on social media. So these are the realities for a lot of people. Posting that to social media is, I think, what we're just going to see more of as these natural disasters occur, and particularly seeing these front row seats on TikTok. Mm. So, Callan, as we're, as we're going to show here, documenting the aftermath can also be risky for these creators. So what is it they're saying about why they think it's important to show the aftermath of the storm? Because as we see right here, it's not always the safest thing. Yeah, Joe, uh, as a Floridian myself, I know that uh, these floodwaters are incredibly dangerous. There's bacteria in them. The thing that people really tend to look out for are downed power lines or electrical issues in those waters. Um, the the people that I spoke with who have braved those waters have basically told me that they feel a responsibility to their community to show them what's going on. Some of them have even said that they have received thousands of DMs from people who are uh, from these creators who are like still in these areas. Um, they're receiving thousands of DMs, essentially having people ask them, can you go to my home? Mm. Here's where my, my spare key is located. Can you let me know if my home is still there, if my house is flooded, if my business is flooded? So they're braving these conditions because they feel like they're, they've become a resource for their community. They've become a way to help their community who has either fled or is uh, not currently in their home see what the destruction and the toll really has become. Absolutely. Callan, do you think that these creators are going to keep posting about this as there's recovery efforts, rebuilding efforts, things like that? I spoke with several creators yesterday, and they all told me that they, a lot of them typically share their lives anyway. So as right. these recovery efforts go on, they plan to share their lives regardless. But seeing how much it's been important to people to see the actual destruction and I think the recovery, they plan to share this from now on. All right, Callan Rosenblatt, thank you so much. Now to a milestone moment for students and parents alike. Freshman move-in day. It is a day that's taking place at thousands of colleges across the country this week. And today, co-host Craig Melvin headed down to Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey, to help one special student unpack. Bring it out! I heard Rutgers got a great marching band. Ethan couldn't wait to tell you guys. Back in May, Ethan Ty from Old Bridge, New Jersey, announced to the world that not only was he an amazing hip-hop dancer, but in the fall, he would be headed to Rutgers University as a freshman. And a few months later, so are we. Okay, Ethan was just on the show about three months ago. So, Henry, you ready to welcome him? Let's do it. Y'all ready? Yeah! Hey! As 13,000 Rutgers freshmen unload their boxes, bins, and bags into the residence halls, Ethan soon becomes one of them. <laughs> Welcome to Rutgers. Thank you. This is your freshman residence hall. Yes. Yeah, your top floor. It's a penthouse. <laughs> Ethan's sister, Amy, and his mom and dad, May and Ted, provide reinforcements. You feeling good? Um, good, but Oh. <laughs> but excited! Excited, yes. very excited he's moving in. But you know, I'm letting part of my part of my arm leave me. Oh. So. Oh. <laughs> we're empty nesters now. So after officially today, we're This know, is it. This is it. Have you been inside this residence hall? No, I have not. Keep your expectations low. <laughs> this is freshman house. This is your lobby. Ethan is on the top floor, or as we like to call it, the penthouse. Do 
you guys only live like 30 minutes away. Yes. yes. So he wants mommy's home cooking, so hopefully oh, I get to go. He's already yeah. planned that out. <laughs> yeah, pick up laundry. <laughs> you know, pick up laundry. Yeah. 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 You're not going out. <laughs> Then, it's time for an iconic moment in many college freshmen's experience. The dorm room reveal. Oh. That's pretty nice, actually. Is this what you were expecting? Uh, no. <laughs> pretty nice, though. Yeah. And here's the thing. Since you're the first oh, wow. one in, your roommate's not here yet. I get to pick my pick. <laughs> you get to pick your pick. <laughs> window looks pretty There nice. you go. Oh, Smart God. pick. Oh, uh. Mom, Dad, this is where the magic is going to happen. Dad, I'm only going to be here. I'm never going to go out. Ooh. That's going to be the only time he uses that chair. So, I guess we should start unloading the car. All right. Let's do it. I'm going to help. Back to the car for the infamous residence hall load-in. See, so hopefully you packed the light. You did not pack the light. You did not pack the light. Spike ball, of course, gotta have spike ball. Lots of toiletries. We're full service here. Have a today's show. Oh, this is a nice pillow. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, sir. What is this? Shoe bag. Oh, wow. The shoe bag. Gotta have your rock. I mean, that's a, that's a freshman staple. Oh, that's a drying rack. Well, we can put this back here. We're never using it. I don't know if you saw how big that room was. <laughs> it's going to be tricky. Ethan was a little more optimistic than I was about this all fitting in his room, but we're going for it. Ethan decided to bring his entire house with him, apparently. Wait until that kid sees my bill, though. Soon we have a nice little assembly line going. But now that we're getting... Settled in the dorm room. How, how are we feeling? It's surreal right now. He's we're finally getting him moved in, and I'm still, you know, not ready to let go yet. So I'm just very excited to <laughs> the next chapter of his life. Um, are we feeling? Are you good? <laughs> yeah, um, I think so. I wasn't so emotional now, but I feel like seeing it and uh. <laughs> Is it getting real? Yeah, it's getting a little teary myself. <laughs> I'm not even, not even starting my freshman year. <laughs> Listen, there's, there's one more thing that the room needs. Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! And finally, it's time to kick back and admire what we have accomplished. I think it's good. Yeah. It's very nice. Nice. Yeah. And when you need help moving out, I don't want you to call me. <laughs> I will give you the number of a guy. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. You're going to crush it. Thank you. That brings back so many memories. But I they know, just right? put a coffee table in that room? <laughs> I know. There's no room for yeah. it. They, they put Craig to work. That was exactly. funny. <laughs> Thanks to Craig for that report. Thank you. All right, coming up, we've got some breaking economic data this morning. And that can mean only one thing. Our financial dream team, Brian Chung and Investopedia's <laughs> Caleb Silver, join us next on this Labor Day with the latest jobs reports. Stick in around. their sneakers. <laughs> We are back with breaking economic news. The August jobs report is out. More than 187,000 jobs were added last month, more than the 170,000 jobs that economists had predicted. The unemployment rate stands now at 3.8 percent. That's actually up from 3.5 percent from the previous month. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung and Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver are here to help us break down these numbers. Good morning to both of you. So, Brian, what do we need to know about this new jobs data just out? Yeah, good morning. There's a lot of numbers, so let's contextualize it a little bit. The jobs data that we just got showing that there were 187,000 jobs added in the month of August. If you're getting a bit of deja vu, that's because that's the same number that we had added in the month of July on the first read. There were some revisions in there that I think Caleb's going to get to in a second. But uh, regardless, another number that we're really watching very closely is the unemployment rate, as you mentioned. It did tick up to 3.8 percent. Oops, sorry about that. 3.8 percent uh, from last month's 3.5 percent figure. Now, there are deep deviations that you'll see month to month in the unemployment rate. But interesting to see the racial breakdown when you see the black unemployment rate 
going down between July and August, but the Hispanic unemployment rate going up. These are threads we're going to have to continue to watch in the months to come. Absolutely. Caleb, let's bring you in here. Tell us about these revisions. I know that's something that stands out to you. The big revisions in June down 80,000 jobs, overestimating by 80,000 jobs, 30,000 yeah. jobs revised downward in July. That's 110,000 jobs we thought were in the labor economy in the past two months. They were not. So big wow. revisions there. This number here, 187,000 again, kind of a little bit higher than expected, but that unemployment rate ticking up to 3.8 percent. More people are out looking for work. Some of that is the writers and actor strike. Some of that is the yellow trucking bankruptcy. We had some big bankruptcies and mm. the transportation sector actually lost some jobs. So, Brian, what does this August jobs report tell us about the state of the economy right now? Well, it tells us that the rate of hiring is indeed cooling when you consider that the pace that we had seen prior uh, in the earlier parts of the month was over 200,000. So this is lower than that number. But let's unpack by the types of sectors that the viewers might actually sympathize with and might be working in directly. Let's take a look at leisure and hospitality. It's been driving a lot of the job gains post-pandemic. Added 40,000 jobs still in the month. Now, retail trade, these are jobs at the mall cooling a little bit, still gaining jobs up about 6,500 jobs, 6.3 a thousand to be exact. And then healthcare, though, this is actually the big gangbusters part of this report where we saw almost 71,000 jobs added in the month, 70.9 thousand to be exact. So it seems like in the healthcare sector, they're rebounding. This was a sector that had a big shortfall after the pandemic. So uh, interesting to see whether or not those threats also continue in the next months as well. And Caleb, so with the news of those revisions and then this number right now, what do you think this is telling us about the rest of the year, the fourth quarter as we head into the end of the year? Yeah, the labor market is kind of right where the Fed wants. It. It's mm. slowing a little bit, right? Well, the wage gains have actually slowed two to 4.2 percent. So that's the thing the Fed wants: slow down in hiring, slow down in wage growth. We're seeing both of those. The Fed meets in 19 days, five hours, and 20 minutes. I'm not counting. You're counting. <laughs> so this is exactly what I wanted to see. It'll probably hold rates right where they are when mm. it meets again in a couple weeks. Yeah. So let's ask you more about that, Brian. I mean, this new report, all the other information that's out there about the economy right now. How could that impact the Fed's decision on inflation? Which I guess we've been waiting two months now for this decision yeah. when it finally is made. Yeah, I want to drill down on, really importantly on that point that Caleb just made about average hourly earnings. It, the pace was uh, on a yearly basis, 4.4 percent between July of this year and July of last year. This is, again, how much higher you're getting paid on a yearly basis. That slowed to 4.3 percent in August, again, comparing August this year to August of last year. For the Federal Reserve, they're looking at this number and going, OK, well, we don't want this to be a zero figure. But at the same time, we don't want this number to go up because maybe then the employers pass on those higher costs to consumers in the form of higher inflation. Inflation remains the big story here. Unemployment does not in this very weird economy. So when it comes to this picture, the best thing, though, and the really important thing to point out here is that for the first time in uh, over a year, in this summer, we're actually seeing the pace of wage growth over the pace of inflation. Mm. Again, yesterday we saw from PCE about 3.3%, so something really important to note there. All right. Brian and Caleb, thank you both. Appreciate it. Always appreciate you coming by. Interest on student loans is going to start to accumulate again beginning today, September 1st, after being on hold for three years because of the COVID pandemic. Borrowers will make their first payments in one month. It comes as about 800,000 people recently saw their student loan debts forgiven thanks to that $39 billion government plan. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now on this. Shaq and I have been talking to some of the borrowers who have had their financial burdens lifted. Good morning. Tell us about this. Hi there, Savannah. Just imagine the roller coaster ride of emotions that many of these borrowers have been feeling. In June, they thought the Supreme Court blocked any hope of any relief in dealing with their student loans. But just a couple of weeks ago, they've been getting messages and emails saying that their loan balance is now zero dollars and zero cents. Everything says paid in full. The relief and celebration came in a flurry. I've been paying on student loans for 38 years. Zero balance. I am thankful for the Biden administration finally coming through. The Biden administration wiping away $39 billion in student debt. To see zero, I'm used to seeing zero in my checking account, not my student loans or a credit card or anything like that. So it's shocking. After more than 20 years of payments, Sarah Walsh's $40,000 balance gone overnight. How? The Education Department just did a one-time adjustment to fix errors with some programs that forgive loans after decades of monthly payments. Borrowers got credit for late or partial payments and for the time servicers put their loans in an extended pause or forbearance. These borrowers 
should have been in an income stream payment plan. If the system had worked, these borrowers would have had their loans canceled a long time ago. While this isn't the widespread cancellation that the Supreme Court blocked in June, the administration says this relief will impact more than 800,000 borrowers. What does this forgiveness mean to you? I'm not so pressured to pay my bills that I have. I can start budgeting a way to get a car um, since I've never owned a car in my entire life. With college debt now nearing $1.8 trillion nationwide, the president is celebrating the change and previewing additional action. I promise to fix the problems of the existing student loan program that hurt borrowers for much too long. And I'm proud we're keeping that promise. We think it's unlawful, uh, illegal, and ultimately uh, unconstitutional. But two conservative groups are launching another legal fight, asking federal courts to block future forgiveness. This is not just some sort of administrative fix. What they're doing is just trying to maximize uh, cancellation of loans as much as possible and using this, uh, this so-called adjustment as a, as a pretext. Uh, for doing so. But as it stands, cancellation that many thought was a dream is now a reality. I kept logging in to make sure that it said zero. And it still says zero. It still says zero, and the smile hasn't left my face. Smile still on her face. For those borrowers who still have those loans, who still have payments that will start to become due on October or uh, on October 1st, uh, the administration has launched a new plan. It's called the SAVE plan. It's an income-driven repayment plan where you only have to pay 5% rather than 10% of your discretionary income. And it'll also stop the practice of if you're paying those minimum payments, your balance still increasing because of that interest. It will cap the amount of interest on those loans. If you're interested oh. in that, that, go online and uh, look at whitehouse.gov and you can get a little bit more information about that plan. Savannah, Great Joe? information on something that's been really confusing. Shaq, thank you so much. More financial news now. Disney's ongoing dispute with one major cable provider is heating up this morning. CNBC reporter Pippa Stevens is back with that and other financial news. Hey, Pippa, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Disney is in talks with Charter Communications on a new distribution deal after it pulled ESPN, ABC, and other cable channels off Charter's Spectrum service. Disney's cable networks went dark yesterday in the middle of live coverage of the U.S. Open on ESPN, leaving only a black screen. Charter has more than 32 million customers in 41 states. The Nintendo Switch is getting a Mario makeover. The tablet has a new red color scheme to coincide with the release of the new game Super Mario Bros. Wonder. It also has a Mario silhouette and some coins hidden beneath the back panel. The special edition console will be available on October 6th, although it's already up for pre-order from Nintendo and Best Buy. And Fisker is releasing more details on its new electric crossover vehicle. The pair has a so-called Houdini trunk with the touch of a button. The rear window rolls down into the hatch, and then the entire door disappears into the body of the car. Fisker says it designed the trunk with people who live in the city in mind, because if you're parallel parking, you don't want to have to worry about the trunk swinging into another huh. car. I'm a little bit confused about that model, seeing those pictures. <laughs> also, the pair is such an interesting choice for a car name. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Everyone, in my pair. I do, th <laughs> I do think about that, though, when you see cars parked so close to each other, yeah. like you could never get in there. You know what I mean? You're going to have to pull out into the street to get something out of your trunk, but... Anyway, yeah, we can always use help on parallel parking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Pippa. Thank appreciate you. it. Coming up, the summer of Swift may be coming to an end. But the autumn of Swift is just beginning as August slips away. With her sold-out Eras tour now coming to a movie theater near you, we will explain after the break. Welcome back. So we haven't seen too many stars on red carpet since the Hollywood actor strike started, but Adam Driver appeared at the Venice Film Festival for the premiere of his eagerly awaited movie, Ferrari. Driver and director Michael Mann received a six-minute standing ovation after the movie, the actor appearing to be emotional. Oh, he was able to attend thanks to an agreement that allows independent films to be promoted during the strike. So as we get toward the end of the year, some of the more artsy films that are out, you may mm -hmm. see some mm -hmm. promotion for those, but many others you won't. It'll be a little different depending on each movie. Yeah, uh, yeah, because there's those exceptions that some can get. It's sort of yeah. confusing. Actually, that's what the, we're about to talk about now. Taylor right, Swift's so, movie got one of these. <laughs> exactly. So if you've been paying any attention this summer, especially to this show, then you'll know this has been the summer of Swift. Taylor Swift's era's tour breaking records, impacting people from all walks of life, including 
news anchors. <laughs> now, for anyone who may have missed a chance to see her in person, I feel for you, but I'm so excited for you now. For those of us who just want to see it again, also like me, the Eras Tour is coming to a theater near you. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has the scoop on how to see Tay Tay on the silver screen. Hey there, well, when was the last time you had to wait in an online queue to buy a movie ticket? That's the kind of demand Taylor Swift is driving now that she's gearing up to take over thousands of theaters next month with a two-hour and 45-minute concert film. And no, Swifties will not calm down. Taylor Swift is entering her movie theater era. Welcome to the Eras Tour. Bringing her sold-out concert tour that's dazzled fans around the world to the big screen this fall. The Cruel Summer singer writing on social media, the Eras Tour has been the most meaningful electric experience of my life so far, adding in an apparent nod to her lucky number. Starting October 13th, you'll be able to experience the concert film in theaters in North America at thousands of AMC locations. <laughs> Within minutes of Thursday's announcement, the demand from devoted Swifty started driving delays at the box office that her fans know all too well. When I went in the app, it was literally 25 minutes of a wait time. And then when I was getting the tickets, everything was already sold out. AMC, which is also distributing the film to other theaters, warned of potential delays and outages during ticket sales, even after upgrading its website to handle five times the previous traffic. Chloe Charlton is excited to bring her kids to finally see their favorite singer. The movie is just such an awesome opportunity for them to get to experience it at a reasonable time and a reasonable price. Industry experts expect the Eras Tour film to rival the success of major Hollywood hits, even prompting horror film The Exorcist Believer to change its original Friday the 13th release date, with the founder of Bloomhouse writing, look what you made me do, and hashtag Exorswift. What does that say about the power of Taylor Swift? We've never had such recognition of, oh, this is a tsunami coming to the box office and we are going to get out of the way of it. Swift has released films about previous tours, but only after they wrapped. This time, she's in the middle of her record-setting stadium tour that's become a cultural phenomenon. Polestar estimates the Eras Tour could gross a record-breaking one and a half billion plus dollars throughout its 20-month run. With such high demand, the average seat in the U.S. surged to a jaw-dropping $1,130 on ticket reseller StubHub. It's a lot of money, a lot of effort, but again, it's worth it. Just, you know, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. The movie offers a far cheaper and more accessible way for fans to experience the Eras Tour at 1989. A reference to her 2014 pop album that she's re-releasing also in October. As the summer of Swift looks to extend into autumn. At two hours and 45 minutes, the film will be slightly shorter than her marathon concert that spans her 17-year career. AMC theaters plan to show it at least four times a day on Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays, but it's not exactly clear exactly how many weeks it will run. And according to Deadline, ticket presales are already past $10 million and counting, rivaling some Marvel movie releases. Back to you. All right, Emily Aketa, thank you so much. Cannot wait. Well, it's Friday, which means it's time for all the new movies and TV shows out this weekend that you just can't miss. Entertainment journalist and pop culture expert Brian Balthazar joins us now. Brian, good morning. All right, let's stick with movies. Two action-packed ones in theaters today. We've got The Equalizer 3 with Denzel and The Good Mother. What should we know about these ones? Okay, The Equalizer 3, amazing. Obviously, Denzel Washington, Dakota Fanning also in this one. And the problem with being an assassin, even a former one, is you end up taking your work home with you. So uh, Denzel's <laughs> character is now living in Italy, and he finds out that his friends are being controlled by the mafia. And as you can see from the clip, he's not going to take that lightly. not just going to sit and eat prosciutto through this. So uh, it's really <laughs> action-packed, really suspenseful, and he really picks some major arse in here that I'm saying arse. And uh, it, it, it looks really gripping. I think this is worth going to the theaters for. And then, of course, we have The Good Mother, which stars Hilary Swank. And this uh, this one is also a suspense thriller with a little bit of a mysterious twist at the end. Hilary Swank is a journalist whose estranged son is murdered, and she teams up with his girlfriend to track down who does it, but they there's a world of corruption and drugs and, of course, that surprise that comes in the middle. Uh, so this is also one worth looking at in the theaters. And then there's also one that you should check out on streaming. Um, this is an interesting one. It's called A Day and a Half. Um, this one's on Netflix, and this is based on a true story. This is about a divorced couple, and the husband goes to the place of work of his ex-wife, 
kidnaps her, takes her hostage, and in search of his daughter. He wants to reunite with his daughter, but there's a cop driving them. This, by the way, is dubbed. This is a Swedish film. And by the way, get used to this because with the strike, a lot of films, as you probably noticed mm -hmm. on streaming, have uh, dubbed or subtitled content. And they're still just as compelling and interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I would watch a movie where Denzel just eats pasta in retirement for. <laughs> what did you say? Prosciutto? What, what did you <laughs> That was so funny, Brian. Uh, okay, all three of those look very intense, by the way. I mean, all those kind of seem like that thriller kind of vibe. Um, now tell us there are two fan favorite fantasy shows on streaming platforms with new seasons out. Tell us about the season two of The Wheel of Time and the final fifth season of Disenchantment. Right. Okay. So the wheel of time. Where do I bid? We could we could spend the whole segment talking about this. This is kind of it's based on fourteen novels, and the novels have about two thousand wow. seven hundred characters. So watch season one first. <laughs> it is a mythical, fantastical world, uh, which of course these mythical, fantastical worlds are always in danger, in threat. So um, this one, I really do think you should catch up because it tees off where season one left off. Season one was the most popular series on Prime in two thousand twenty one, but it's been a minute in case you didn't notice. So check that out. And then we have Disenchantment. Uh, also, um, this one's on Netflix. And this is from Matt Groening. And this is typical. You know him from The Simpsons and Futurama. Um, this is Princess Bean. She's got a troubled relationship with her mother. She's an alcoholic. She has her demons. And her demon is one of the characters in the show. Um, but she's discovering her mythical powers. And she's going to save the world. So this is worth watching and very funny as well. And this is its final season. All right. And let's talk about music. Nicki Minaj dropping a new song just yeah. in time for your holiday week weekend playlist last time i saw you what should we know right okay this is a good one check it out uh last time i saw you this is going to be part of her upcoming album um a pink lady 2 which by the way um a pink friday 2 i should say and this her pink friday the first one was her debut album which you know went triple platinum um this one's a great song it's her new single third one on the the album that's being released in november and you know she's up for like five vmas uh for super freaky girls so this is just one that we're checking out singing and rapping on this one and i think this one's going to stay on the charts a while but you know i'm not good at predicting these things <laughs> <laughs> are you bad at that i didn't know that yeah i'm terrible Terrible, terrible. We, have no, we have no idea. Sorry, I, I understand. We're I'm not so stupid. happy to have you as our expert here, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a great weekend, Brian. Thanks for joining yeah, happy us. Happy Labor Day. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.